This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton and joining me today is Cameron Spence, a PhD candidate in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. The topic we're going to talk about is psychiatric home treatment. Could we just begin by spelling out what that is? Home treatment is basically a psychiatric team consisting of psychiatrists, nurses, support workers, and social workers. And they go to the home once in the morning, once at night, and they administer medication, they talk to the patient, they do a bit of supportive counseling, and it usually lasts between one week and three or four months at max. And so the idea is that you're visiting somebody who's got psychiatric problems in their own home. Presumably that has cost implications. It must be cheaper than that person being within a hospital ward, for instance. It's certainly cheaper than being within a hospital ward. And, I mean, home treatment's used a lot to as a deferral service away from the wards. So if a person's not quite as ill as they should be to go on a ward, home treatment will pick them up and start to work with them. And is this something that's found across the world, or is it, is it unique to Britain? It's almost unique to Britain. It is found in a couple of Scandinavian countries, but for the most part, Britain is probably the largest user of home treatment, and home treatment extends through England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and Scotland as well. So that's slightly bizarre, because you would think it's an obvious solution to somebody with not particularly severe psychiatric problems is to go and visit them. Well, I mean, it is an obvious solution, but it's also not a well-evidenced solution. In 2000, the government brought home treatment in as a national policy, and at the time, there was very thin evidence that it was, one, better than the wards, or two, that it was better than community mental health teams. One of the big factors is, is that it reduces the use of beds and it reduces the the cost of care and that's probably the the main reason that they brought it in. And so what's the history of this? Is it something you you mentioned it was brought in as a national policy in 2000 but it must have had a prehistory. The prehistory dates back to the 1930s in Amsterdam um, and during the Great Depression they decided that it was just not affordable to keep people in asylums in Amsterdam. And so they tasked a psychiatrist with figuring out another way. And the other way was, well, we'll treat people in their homes and hopefully that'll be as good. And it turned out to be a a success and it's still used in Amsterdam. So pre-1930, everybody with psychiatric problems who's diagnosed will end up in an asylum? Not technically. I mean, there were some other programs that went on. I mean, Going all the way back to the 1600s, you could look at Giel in Belgium as a residential treatment center where people were boarded out to families and the families were paid to keep them and they'd, you know, love them like their own. And it was a great place for people to go. Of course, during the 1600s, all the way up to present day, it was, you know, rich people who would drop their sons and daughters off and leave them there. So still not a great life. But for most other people, it was the asylums until the 1930s and then you have home treatment that develops across the world some in united states one in canada one in australia although these ones don't continue but the major one was the training and community living center in madison wisconsin and they took the model that was kind of around for amsterdam and they turned that into more of a training people to live in the community. I'm really interested in how you go about researching this topic. How do you find out about psychiatric home treatment? It's not really a a very well-studied phenomenon. So the best way to go about doing it is not to collect quantitative data. Other people do that, and it doesn't really show what happens. A lot of the psychiatric research says, well, we treat people in the home. But what is treating people in the home? What do they do when they enter the home? And so the best way to go about doing this is doing an ethnography, which is basically going out and being part of the team, participating and observing what's going on, and also interviewing patients and interviewing home treatment team members. And how often do you go out on these visits? 
I do four to five days a week with the home treatment team. I go out on visits every day. I see maybe two to three people a day, and I'll hopefully see those same people about five times. I also take part in home treatment team meetings. I take part in clinical reviews. I take part in trust meetings when I can. And I also occasionally attend mental health act assessments. So you've become almost a participant observer. I have become a participant observer. And in some ways, I become a member of the team. You know, when things get a little more intense, because you can only go out with two people in each home, because let's face it, this is London and the homes are small. (laughs) And uh, when things get intense, I have to participate. And how do you record what happens? When I'm in the team base, I write everything down on in notebooks. When I'm outside of the team base, I'm basically using my memory as a tape recorder, right? So I'm trying to intensely take in everything around me, and then once I get back to the team base, immediately I type up between three and 5,000 words a day. That's incredibly labor-intensive. It is. <laughs> but no one said a PhD would be fun. You've been doing this for a while now, and... What have you noticed about this in relation to austerity? Because we are in a situation where all kinds of cuts are being made to services, and this must have an impact on on what you're doing. When it comes to home treatment, you look through the history, and you basically see that it's always attached to an economic logic, right? It saves the use of beds, and it saves money. Um, And that extends all the way through to 2000, when the home treatment teams came into effect. And at that point, they started running down the number of beds that the services had. So between 1998 and 2012, bed levels plummeted by 39%. And now, post-2008 financial crisis, the Conservative government's introduced policies of austerity. And what those policies have done is basically... Um, You have social care cuts, so 30,000 people who suffer from mental health conditions have lost any social care support. Uh, You have changes to the benefits system that have increased benefits sanctions, so that's when uh, benefits are removed for a period of time because the person who received the benefits wasn't able to uh, do whatever they wanted them to do, usually visit a job center. And those sanctions have gone up 668% for people with mental health conditions. So as a consequence of the benefit sanctions going up by 668%, you have people who go into crisis and end up either in the ward or with home treatment teams. And so this puts an increased pressure on home treatment teams and an increased pressure on the ward. You also have NHS cuts, which are basically causing havoc in the community mental health teams. They used to go out and visit people in their homes once a week, but now they're seeing people in the team base every two weeks. You also have the development of teams called low-intensity treatment teams, which is basically a euphemism for we'll see you once a month and check your bloods. And so what happens is it's not like the old mental health system, right? The ward is not a place where you go for respite. It's not an asylum anymore. What it is is a place where you can go get intensive treatment for 7 to 14 days based on a triage model, and then you're out with home treatment team. And so what you see is a speeding up of care. Can the system cope with this increased number of people making demands on it? It can cope. And the way that it's coping is that the trust is reorganizing the way they use home treatment. And so by drawing people off the wards and moving people out through home treatment as quick as possible, they're changing the model of care. But the thing is, is that They're changing a model of care without having any new psychopharmaceutical drugs, without having, well, anything new whatsoever. They're just tooling with the model of care. And so what you get is a system that has high human costs to it. And those human costs come from the cuts to the system, cuts to the benefit system, a lack of proper housing, and, you know, the, just the, the busyness of London and the fact that it's not at times a nice place to live. That's quite a pessimistic view of something which I know you think is a good system. Home treatment is an excellent way to treat people. I mean, l- l- let's get that straight. It's much better than being in the ward. In the wards 
back in the 90s were called atherapeutic. And now, partly because of home treatment scooping off the patients who aren't super unwell, those wards have become even more of a place where you don't want to go. I mean, I was out with a home treatment team member and we had a very depressed woman who was very anxious and was jumping at noises. And she said, well, you know, take me to hospital. And we had to basically tell her that hospital's not a nice place for depressed people because the rate of psychosis and the disruption in the ward because people who are very unwell are going there doesn't make it a place of asylum anymore. So home treatment is the best possible service that you can get. At the same time, home treatment ends up holding on to a lot of risk. There are studies that show that home treatment isn't particularly good at preventing suicide, but it is good at containing patients. And how they contain patients is basically by showing up once a day in the morning and showing up once a day at night. And that allows the person to know that, yes, there are people coming to talk to me, they're going to help me take my medication, and I can plan my day around those things. And it forces them to plan their day around those things. Also, funny enough, home treatment can happen outside of the home. They can be invited to come to the team base to see them, and that's another way of structuring their day. And so if you look at being on the ward compared to home treatment, home treatment, you get to stay in your home, you get to see people who are going to talk to you twice a day, they'll help you take your medication, They'll counsel you a, bit, a little bit, and they may even help you with daily activities like washing clothes or reorganizing your house. But at the same time, patients are upset that they see different faces. It's not the same people that visit you every day. The team that I work on has 35 people, and so any given day, you're going to see someone different. And they all have different styles. Some are more beloved by patients than others. But for the most part, these are very caring people who are very good at their jobs. How do you see the future of psychiatric treatment in the home? Both realistically, what's going to happen, but also ideally, what would you like to happen? The future of psychiatric home treatment is more of it. It's going to be more and more a crucial part of the system. It's already a fulcrum between the ward and the community mental health teams, and it's just going to grow. It is the safety net for those teams and so when cuts happen to those teams and something bad happens home treatment is often there to scoop patients up but at the same time treatment is speeding up and people are starting to go through the system faster and so what ends up happening is that people can often be taken for a ride so instead of advocating for the treatment they need and the treatment they want they end up going along for whatever treatment comes their way, which is a problem. And so I think the best thing for home treatment to do would be to train patients or to teach patients how to advocate for themselves. So do you need psychological therapy? Yes, you need to ask for psychological therapy. If they can ask and if they can advocate for themselves, they can get the services they need in a timely manner and also put pressure on the system so that the government is aware that they need more capacity and they won't just do with the capacity they have. Cameron Spence, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Health and Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.